on the rocky edge of Kenai Fjords, in the shadow of a vast ice field, the black oyster catcher makes her home. Here, tides rise and fall. Fierce storms pelt the shoreline. Massive glaciers flow, calving into the icy sea. And still, the oyster catcher survives, returning each season to nest on a narrow band of beach. In this wild and weather-beaten landscape, where dramatic change is constant, life abounds. In a place this grand, it would be easy to think that Kenai Fjords National Park is timeless and unchanging. But the opposite is true. Here, the mountains, glaciers, and shoreline are in a constant state of transformation. From season to season, even from day to day, the raw process of change is ongoing unfolding before our very eyes. One of the things that has always struck me about this landscape is that things are very big. They're made of stone. They're these giant glaciers, and, and they have this air of being so large that that implies somehow that they're permanent and everlasting. And yet, what I've seen over the course of my 20-some years out here is that they change on a scale that's more rapid than you would imagine. Northwestern Glacier, for example, when I first came out here, was a 300-foot wall of ice dumping icebergs into the fjord. Now it's receded a couple miles, and you can paddle up the fjord in areas that were once buried under hundreds of feet of ice. And the fact that something that massive and powerful uh, can change in your lifetime is just an impressive quality of this landscape. If you spend enough time in it, you realize that an environment like this is very delicate. Kenai Fjords National Park, perched on the northwestern edge of the continent, is a place where mountains, ice and ocean meet. The Harding Ice Field sits at the top of the park, covering 800 square miles of the Kenai Mountains. Formed more than 23,000 years ago, it is part of the ice sheet that covered much of North America during the last ice age. Winter storms can bring over 100 feet of snow to these mountains every year. The snowflakes amass and, over time, compact into dense ice thousands of feet thick. More than 30 glaciers spill off of this ice field towards the valleys and sea below. From the highest peaks to the deep, finger-like fjords, a complex, interconnected ecosystem thrives. On bare rock at a glacier's edge, tiny plants find a foothold. Stands of Sitka spruce tower in the northernmost edge of North America's temperate rainforest. And where tidewater glaciers calve into the ocean, a convergence of glacial melt, salt water, sunlight, tides, and currents creates a nutrient-rich environment for phytoplankton to bloom. This is the basis of the fjord's entire food web, supporting seabirds and other marine life from the tiniest zooplankton to 45-ton humpback whales. Generations of people have also been sustained by these bounties. Trappers and traders, fishermen and entrepreneurs, explorers and artists, like Rockwell Kent, who spent a fall and winter on Fox Island back in 1918. 
The book and paintings that were inspired by his stay brought the beauty of this remote place to public view. But long before any adventurers came here, the Sukpiak, a maritime people, made their home in the fjords. For over a thousand years, they endured and adapted to the harshness of the weather and the landscape. Our ancestors were nomadic people and traveled great distances in their kayaks in search of food. When the Russians arrived on the Kenai Peninsula in the late 1700s, the Sukpiak lifestyle changed dramatically. They began hunting sea otters in large numbers to exchange their pelts for trade goods. With their way of life altered and their population reduced by disease, the last of the Sukpiak left the outer coast by the end of the 1800s, settling in established communities. For the Munin Kvaznikov family, a visit to the fjords is in some ways a journey home. A lot of my family lived out this area. We traveled all these coastlines. A lot of good uh, food on the beach. It's like, you know, tide is out, the table is set. The foods of these fjords were first named in Sugpiak. Got uh, mussels, you call them amyaks. And uh, clams, a salak. And you got uh, cockles, they're called tehutak. Snails, and you know, it's, it's pretty much anything off the beach. Kelp, pop kelp, or ribbon kelp. My ancestors lived here, and living here and coming to visit here are two very different things. I really am enjoying my time having forests out here with us, sharing the knowledge that I have learned through my lifetime, knowing that it will go on for generations long after I'm gone. I completely forgot about how tasty these plants are. How did the um, elders say that they would preserve these? They would dry a, a lot of plants, but like these kind of plants are kind of succulent. They probably wouldn't dry so well. So they would s store them in seal oil fat, and then they would be able to have um, fresh greens in the wintertime when they needed. In a wilderness like this, I feel more connected to our ancestors and how they would live. This is the wrong plant. It looks like kind of similar. See how close they look like each other? Mm -hmm. But you could see this one, the smell of it is different. It is an empowering thing for myself because you know that you can go out in the wilderness and gather all the plants that she showed me that are edible. And the salad was awesome. Today, there are few visible traces of the first people who lived here, but their story continues in their descendants and in this wild land. The powerful forces of weather and the changing climate underscore every story in Kenai Fjords. Over the millennia, glaciers have retreated and advanced with natural cycles of warming and cooling. As they advance, they plow into the earth, gouging the bedrock with their massive weight. As the glaciers recede, they leave behind U-shaped valleys or fjords that fill with glacial melt, seawater, and marine life. The most recent glacial advance ended in the mid-1800s. In that period, called the Little Ice Age, the glaciers at Kenai Fjords reached far beyond where they end today. In the past few decades, the relatively steady rate of retreat has accelerated, largely as a result of human-induced climate change. 
In a piece of historical good fortune, the National Park Service has a hundred-year-old visual record of glaciers in Kenai Fjords. In 1909, two USGS geologists came up to Alaska, and their primary purpose was mining interests and mapping the Kenai Peninsula. And they happened to take these really excellent photographs of many of our tidewater glaciers that serve as a fantastic baseline now that we go back to for comparison. That's Ojai Glacier right there. And then this is Anchor Since Glacier. 2004, here, so the park has been re-photographing the glaciers from the same vantage point. The result is an extraordinary record of glacial change. We have pictures of Grant and Higgins on glaciers. And obviously, most of that ice is gone. And so when we tried to recreate some of these pictures, it was a challenge trying to figure out where they were. Most of our repeat photographs of Tidewater glaciers are done from water, which presents its own challenge in, OK, we've got this GPS unit, but now we've got winds and currents that we're competing with and trying to snap that perfect picture to really show the change. The repeat photography studies give us really great visual evidence of changes that are happening, changes that are due to a warming climate. Most of the glaciers in this park are melting, and we have a few really dramatic examples. McCarty Glacier has retreated about 15 miles back from where that original image was taken. Northwestern has retreated about eight miles back. Scientific studies high on the Harding ice field confirm that the ice field and many of its glaciers are getting thinner as the balance of winter snow and summer melt changes. Glacial retreat is easy to witness at the face of Exit Glacier. Every few days, if you go out there, you see how it's melting and how it's different. As the glaciers thin and retreat, biologists and marine scientists are asking another set of questions about the impact of these rapid changes on sea life and coastal ecosystems. We don't really know what's going to happen when the glaciers are gone. They're clearly a source of freshwater inputs, which can be really important. They hold carbon and carbon helps with higher productivity. These are long-term questions with no quick and easy answers. Studying the glaciers and the animals that live here is essential to protecting this place. Black oyster catchers may tell us a lot about the health of the coastal environment. They rely solely on this very narrow band of the intertidal. They nest here, they breed, and they forage in the intertidal. So if something is changing, then we should see it reflected in their populations and productivity. We want to look at the whole nearshore food web. So we collect prey items, things that they bring back to the nest to feed their chicks. What is it? How many? How big are they? And track those changes over time. Ultimately, I think with monitoring, not only are we getting the sense of how the environment is doing, but maybe even start to think about how adaptable it is to and, uh, potential changes. Two, one, two, eight. Two, one, two, eight. Got it. Sea otters, of course, are charismatic, but they're also a really important player in the near shore to shallow subtidal zone. They are voracious predators in the near shore. They are a marine mammal that doesn't have blubber that lives in the North Pacific. One of the ways they stay warm is to eat a lot. They eat about a third of their body weight a day. The wildlife is, is incredible here. It's a, a very powerful place. 
All the research that we do is hopefully informing management to help protect these wild places. In 1989, the Exxon Valdez oil tanker spilled 257,000 barrels of oil in Prince William Sound, killing about a quarter of a million seabirds and almost 3,000 sea otters. 1,300 miles of coastline were impacted. 20 of those miles were inside the park. Oil still lingers on those beaches today. The oil spill was decades ago, but human impacts, often from far beyond park boundaries, are an ever-present threat. There's shipping channels, collisions, oil drilling, contaminants, marine debris, plastics that we use every day. Animals can eat those, get sick. The list is almost endless of the impacts that we can have on the near shore. To protect this remarkable place, we must be stewards, not just of the park, but of the broader natural world around us. The rich fabric of Kenai Fjord's interconnected ecosystems extends far beyond the shoreline and park boundaries. The Chiswell Islands, remnants of former mountain peaks, are home to an extraordinary concentration of seabirds. Horned and tufted puffin nest by the thousands. Stellar sea lions lounge on rocky ledges. Humpback whales migrate thousands of miles to feed in these rich waters. Everywhere, there are signs of a vibrant and dynamic ecosystem. Kenai Fjord is not subtle, it's big, it's loud, it's dramatic, and it's amazing. Change is inevitable in Kenai Fjords. It is inherent in the very nature of the glaciers. It blows in with each gale from the gulf, descending as rain or snow cloaking the coastal mountains in gray mist or brilliant sunlight. As a visitor to the park, you can witness this dynamic change. You can walk up to Exit Glacier and see its path of retreat. You can hear the thunderous sounds of icebergs tumbling into Ialic Bay. You can kayak in Bear Glacier Lagoon and see the giant icebergs that have calved off the glacier. And you can take your own photographs and document the ongoing changes in Kenai Fjords. When you come out here and you just experience the place, you realize that your life back in your town, working in your office and doing your daily life is so removed from everything that naturally happens in the world. The wilderness and the forest and the trees, everything that exists out here is what sustains our lives. This is that place where I can come and contemplate the infinite and the grand and, and get out of my everyday thinking and feed my spirit. Coming to this place just gives you peace. This place of mountains, ice, and ocean, both rough-hewn and grand, invites us to pause, and in doing so, to appreciate the wildness that is Kenai Fjords National Park.